Hello and welcome. Yep. And hello and welcome to The Scumbag, episode 9, I believe. I, I'm copying the Chapo House style of uh, not quite knowing what episode we're on, which is not an insult. I thought it was quite charming. And today it's all about winning. With I'm here with Felix, of course. Hey, everybody. Uh, we're going to tell you today how to uh, be your best self. To learn from failure, uh, learn that failure is good, learn to have the winning mindset, and uh, always just be unrelentingly positive. And also that you literally can't fail. That's a very important thing. Failure is good, but also doesn't exist. And it's, it's super important for you to know this. No one has ever failed. Ever. Ever. Uh, other than those who allow themselves to fail. Those people created failure... And they're hurting the human race. And to be really specific, there's just... I would I would cut these two groups yeah, pretty much down the middle. You've got the over-positivity people. So you've got people like DJ Khaled. You've got Tony Robbins. And then you've got just the wank staying like, Oh, yeah! And Felix put it beautifully with the, Well, you, you don't see me at the club? Well, I don't see you at the bank type memes. Yeah, those are... So, yeah, what we're... T- talking about today is like it's a very specific type of thing and you know i consider myself an amateur historian of this type of thing and if i had to guess when this stuff first started popping up the the ethic of uh every time you fail you're learning how to succeed uh i don't see you at you don't see me at the club i don't see you at the bank uh, the memes of the guys with huge beards and three-piece suits with motivational words written on. Or more popularly, more popularly, the most popular thing to do is t- to take a screenshot from a movie that's actually about a person with a singular-minded pursuit of success that destroys them, like yeah. Wolf of Wall Street or Goodfellas. And people take these screenshots from these movies and are like, no, I, I want to be like these guys. But I think this first popped up around 2010. In 2010, if you guys remember, uh, Occupy was still kind of big. Um, people were reeling from the post-jobs recovery economy. And uh, it caused people to do things like become dubstep DJs or sell Herbalife. And uh, – you know, they said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't see what's so bad about the economy. I think it's great. I'm like, I can become a millionaire any day. And it was sort of a psychosis that formed out of economic hardship. You see, America is less vulnerable to Weimar reactionary fascism from economic hardship than we are to post really stupid yeah. memes. And internalize economic failure as their own fault for not working hard And there's this amazing – and Silicon Valley, of course, comes into it because that's all I know about ever. But they really do. And the earliest I can remember would actually be about 2009 when they started up this horrible horrible thing which made sense at the time, I'm sure, called FailCon, which is a one-day conference in San Francisco celebrating failure. But, you know, I thought San Francisco had 365 days a year to do that. But, um, yeah, fuck. But seriously, though, this is an entire conference about people going up and talking about their biggest fail, and it's incredible. That's a... Yeah. It's beautiful. That's a very... It's a very Silicon Valley thing. Like, I've read about so many companies where they're like, we give a bonus to somebody that has, like, the worst idea. <laughs> because it shows their career. Because it shows that they're courageous. I kind of wish that I got, like, I, I should have that award, like, daily. I want to have that award. I feel like I deserve it. I feel like, like, I deserve many things. And it's, and, and the funny thing is that I, I'm not looking for any attention here, but I was in a car accident recently where I got a concussion, and yet I still read these things, and I I feel smarter and so you've got these silicon valley of course easy punching bag you got people like valor afshar who i don't know what he does his his twitter profile is just chief digital evangelist salesforce and a picture of him with this kind of sex doll smile and the salesforce logo and tweets like they're amazing tweets because they're kind of similar in construction to the harambe tweets of like h something something like a something something but it's like, there are two kinds of people, the takers and the givers. The first think they end up with more, but it's the second that sleep better at night. doesn't mean anything, but it makes you feel good if you don't think. 
You know, I've seen I, I I've seen this guy pop up a lot, and it's always like something happens, and he's he'll like anything, like anything will happen, and he'll have a take that's like. That's what happens when you're like more afraid to fail than you are excited to succeed, or he's just yeah, like you said, like a just platitude that means nothing. Like uh, <laughs> he'll be like, "I met with all the sales leaders today. I told them all to write down the worst thing that anyone has ever said to them and put it into a hat, and we threw the hat into the ocean. We ate." Those things we we, put, we baked the cake and we put them inside. Like, and this guy is not alone, but he says things like habits of happy people. One, teach others. Not true. Two, learn new skills. Actually, untrue. It's actually quite painful and makes you sad. Three, stay optimistic. Fuck you. Four, show gratitude. Five, and just so we're clear, this guy never responds to anyone because it's so transparent. Someone else runs his account. Five, pay it forward. Again, nothing. Six, no entitlement. Seven, laugh more. It's like someone poisoned business with, well, yoga, I guess. Or those people who are like, eat clean, dress dress cheaply, I don't know. Like, do yoga for five minutes a day, take a walk. I never see any of them, by the way, which would actually work. Like, have a nice glass of wine, jack off, watch something stupid, which is way better. Yeah, it's never any, like, hedonistic thing, which, like... no. I think you should always do something. I mean, I guess you could clarify this into this is my success. Yeah. Success mean, <laughs> but uh, I actually have you know quintupled my earnings potential by constantly violating the TOS and uh, being hedonistic. So I think it's good. But no, I'm the same way. You know what? It, you know what? I we might diverge here, but here what I think about like the. The success meme stuff is it has the appearance of like Zen mysticism yeah. bullshit, which I sort of blame blame Phil <laughs> Jackson for. Phil Jackson, the former Bulls coach, who was like, "Yeah, I, I fucking make my players <laughs> meditate." And uh, but if you actually like look at what they're saying, it's very uh, it's very like Calvinist. Yeah, you're always like denying pleasure. Every moment of your life has to be devoted to productivity. Yeah, and this it's it's vaguely Saint Thomas Aquinas, uh, Aquinian, I guess you'd call it. But it was the same thing where it's like there's a doctrine you must live by. It's like don't have a doctrine, but totally yeah. fucking have a doctrine. And we're not be never be judgmental, but I am judging you for how you're acting. And Phil Jackson is a great example because he's talking about. And I just remembered this wonderful fucking quote from him. Remember, he was a, like a basketball executive, maybe or a coach, maybe. I can't remember specifically. He was a coach. He was a coach of the Bulls during the golden era. Well, in the and 90s. I, I just checked myself, and it says wisdom is always an overmatch for strength. Let me tell you something. If there was like some like wise old monk, like going up against like Michael Jordan, I don't think he'd just fucking sit there and be like, "Well, you know, Michael, even if you win." You have lost because you are not at peace. So he just fucking spin around and would just walk past casually because he's fucking strong and just throw the ba- basketball in the hoop. Seems pretty fucking elementary to me. And it's like if you meet the Buddha in the lane, feed him the ball. Phil Jackson's wonderful. I think I think he's an insane person and I kind of like it. I think it's great too. Uh, he is obviously a great coach, but I actually don't think like the East Asian mysticism actually like is. Oh, what I'm made being sarcastic. I, oh, okay. I, I think he's deplorable for saying these fucking things. Don't get me wrong. Great coach though. I mean, it's not any worse than oh, no. any other coach. I mean, look at look at anything any other coach has ever said, and it's stupid. Pete Carroll is the only good coach because he's for nine eleven <laughs> truth. But uh, uh, the. So Phil Jackson espouses all this like aesthetic uh, Zen bullshit, but like okay, uh, who is who like really drove the Bulls to success in the nineties? Buddha, not well close. Yeah, Michael oh Jordan. sorry, really easy to mix him up, but still, it, I I do like though that this has poisoned that it's gone beyond tech and startups. In the it's it, it is the people that we would have looked at like twenty thirty years ago even 10 years ago, maybe, and would have said, like, oh, fuck off. Like, Tony Robbins, great example of someone who was recently on the cover of Complex with DJ Khaled, and we'll get there. But the things that he used to say, I remember when I first heard about Tony Robbins, 
I don't care if he's a nice bloke or not. But he was just like a crazy person. Like Everyone I knew who mentioned it was like, hey, he just talks a lot of shit and no one takes him seriously. And now he's like back and people are like taking him seriously. Is it like that people... I think it might be like the, the post-Matrix effect of everyone wanting to feel fucking intelligent. I think that... Um like going back to Phil Jackson yeah. a little bit. So like they, this is like an espousing of like aesthetic, uh, fucking deny yourself, d- achieve a state of mind beyond individuality bullshit. But okay, the Bulls were mostly successful because of Michael Jordan, and no one is more, no one lives against those values more yeah. than Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is like one of the most selfish athletes ever. He's a fucking dick to everyone he knows. He just is a degenerate gambler. And it, it shows how little that, that all that means. Okay, so like Tony Robbins is another good example. Tony Robbins is like he is all about uh, just relentless positivity in the face yeah. of everything. But like lo- look at look at like the look at the people that like Tony Robbins. Yeah. They're just, they're just the most negative, <laughs> hateful people ever. And I ever. love it. All of these have a pretty universal theme. Even the tough guy ones who are vaguely negging their audience. They all say shit like, and I quote Tony Robbins, it is in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. That sounds profound, but that's about as profound as it is what it is. It just means, yeah, when you make a decision, some, your future is made because literally that's... Indecision is also a dis- uh, It just means nothing, and all of these things mean nothing. And I think that, in the same way that you get people retweeting Donald Trump hate to their Donald Trump hating fan base, it's this kind of thing of wanting to seem a certain way. It, is, it goes back to personal branding. It's like, oh, I've retweeted the person saying the positive thing, so I am a positive, nice, smart person. And it's just amazing. I, I love it. I like how many of these axioms are just like, be nice to people. Smile. I mean, we like we crack on Rich Piana, but Rich Piana like he'll say things like this, but he'll like do a video telling some fucking weird story where he actually like lives his values. Like Rich Piana is a big be nice to everyone guy, but he told this weird story where he like spotted a guy on chest day and he ended up being a casting director for a commercial and Rich made seventy thousand dollars. God bless. Yeah, because Rich Piana is, he like lives a blessed life. He's a very blessed man. But this is not going to work for everybody. And Rich Piana as well, when you look at what he's doing, and he could be lumped in with these people, but I think where he breaks it is he really seems like he believes it. No, yeah, Rich, he absolutely believes it. And he truly cares. He like, That's the one thing. Watching Cold from a few episodes ago, I remember watching it and being like, this bloke is a bit office rocker but you know what he actually genuinely cares about the success yes he's making money either that or he's an amazing actor but i get the sense he truly cares like there's not there's there is money making but he's like if someone came to us said rich i have been following the five percent diet and i'm completely off he definitely he definitely strikes me as the type to respond and be like god oh, i'll help you you know he would yeah he would tell you something even if it didn't make sense and it was like bad advice like, he would tell you to, like, drink a gallon of milk every two hours or something. But he would, like, care to help you. None of these people would. As proven by Vala Afshar, and I'm sorry to bring him up again, this kind of soulless automaton, but you're going to love this because there are two quotes he has shared from the famous philosopher Ronald Reagan. We can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. And there is no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets credit. Both of it, like, okay, the second one actually strikes me as, like, a little more horrifying. Yeah, definitely. Because it just, like, you, you, okay, like, let's read between the lines on that a little bit. What does that strike you as when a Silicon Valley guy says that? That strikes me as, like, I'm going to steal people's intellectual property. Which he does. This guy does regularly, including literally the picture and the quote. And he steals people's shit all the time. But I like the idea of we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. Said by Ronald Reagan. And I mean, I'm not like up on my Reagan politics and what he did. But I do know that he kind of like fucked with energy quite a lot. He's the reason that a bunch of like people with mental illness were thrown onto the streets of San Francisco. Like, I mean, Reagan, Reagan didn't... I mean, a lot of people love him, but... But he doesn't seem like he made some great decisions at times. Reagan, uh, Reagan did business, uh, 
with, uh, you know, I think my favorite thing from the Reagan administration, uh, the most funny, madcap, hilarious scandal in the last 40 years was Iran-Contra. And Iran-Contra was a thing where the Reagan administration, they were denied funding for a fascist government in Nicaragua, so they sold weapons to Iran uh, around uh, uh, sanctions that were in place against the Iranian regime during the Iran-Iraq war, where they were also selling chemical weapons to Iraq to use on Iran. But they used the money that they spent, that they got from the Iranian weapons deals that were done in secret to fund uh, right-wing death squads who burned nuns alive in Nicaragua. And when I think of a case of, like, we can't help everybody, but every one person can help someone, I think of Iran-Contra. Yeah. Because the we in that case was Congress. Congress was like, we can't help the Nicaraguan death squads. But Reagan was like, all right, well, Oliver North, who I'm putting in charge of this operation, he can help someone. But let's not forget that there's no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets credit. That was the big thing with Iran-Contra. No one wanted to really own up to uh, their responsibility for it. You know, Reagan testified no, no under one oath. Want, no one didn't, wanted to take credit, Felix. Come on. They were – it was a total success meme. Yeah. It's the, in fact, maybe Reagan was the first success meme maker. He started this. It's all Reagan's fault. Yeah. I mean, Reagan was – he failed before he succeeded. Like in 76 – or uh, 80, I mean, rather, when he tried to uh, primary... Or, yeah, no, 76, my bad. When he tried to primary Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination for presidency, he failed. But he's like, no, I'm going to succeed. Like, he learned how to fail against success. And then when he got to the White House, they were like, you have dementia. <laughs> and you're getting Alzheimer's. And fuck? he's like, he's like, no, I'm going to keep succeeding and failing. Dementia is just a hill for me to climb. Exactly, exactly. It was just, like, more failure for him to overcome. Which doesn't exist, of course. And then there It the, doesn't exist. And then there are the more vile ones as well. Dan Blazarian being probably the one of the most vile people, let alone... He's like the... Old, I, I do appreciate, though, people who co-opt fucking idiots into appreciating them. Like, Dan Blazarian's entire Instagram is just him having a lot of muscles and a lot of women around him. He shoved... He sh- he shoved a woman off a fucking roof. Yeah, he broke her foot. <laughs> I will say two things about Dan Blitzerian that are cool. One thing I think is cool is that his dad was a corporate embezzler and stole a lot of money. And it, like, funds Dan's lifestyle. But he pretends that he makes, like, $50 million a year from playing poker. That's cool. I also think the other thing that is cool is how Jack Dan is, despite just, like, only all he seems to do is, like, drink. And hang out in hot tubs and play poker. But he still, like, has a pretty decent bicep vein. I think that's pretty badass. Well, actually, three things. I think the third thing is that people see Dan Blitzerian and they're like, I can be like that. And I think that's cool that he's, like, sort of gaslighting people. Yeah, I think his life is one long gaslight. But what's great as well is, like, all of these people who do these things, they have this kind of, I think in film school they refer to as the synaptic meeting. What you can learn from looking at it. And there's this one one that came up about a week ago where it was him in, like, the mountains. But it just looks like a, like a really shitty field and he's lost. And he has, like, a scraggly beard. He says, right where I'm supposed to be. What, like, lost? They're just fucking lost in a field. Like, well, what? that's like that's that's a big success win thing. Is when you're like, uh, sometimes lost is the most found you can be. I found myself even if I got lost. One one theory I really want. Well, not even a theory. Just one hope I have is that it's gonna go kind of fifty cent style, and it's gonna turn out that like ninety nine percent of this shit is rented. Like he gets on like a uh, like a private jet. And he's actually only rented the private jet to step onto it, then step off of it when the light changes. So he's not actually paid, he's, he's not actually flown anywhere. He's just there. That's success win, though. I think like a big part of success win, as I see, like you ever see the ones that like advise you to be a sociopath? Well, I, I, I am. 
I work in Silicon Valley, so every day. But do you have any specifics? Uh, the ones that are like hold your emotions in always. Oh yeah, I mean that's that's like the fucking sports generation though. Even though their their reporters are so fucking insanely emotional to the point of actual crazy, there is it this amazing core of pretty much every sports. Actually, you know what the sports sportsmen. The woman, I usually pretty normal. The men, for some reason, like the football players, there's definitely no connection with concussions and football. By the way, none, none. Ju- judge based on. I mean, did, but based on these like insane Instagrams they have, like Cam Newton's Instagram or Twitter, where it's just like like a series of emoticons and like a picture of him like lifting or like sitting on a couch. And it's just like, what the fuck? Like I, I read them and people are like, yeah, baby, woo. Or like the, his latest one where it's just a picture of him holding his face clearly from some sort of thing. And it's some sort of garbage text that's like Pete Atapaya unaffected hashtag WMW one love humanity mag. If you read that from one of your friends, you'd either think they like fell on their keyboard or like had a seizure. Like his, his K2 bender. Yeah, <laughs> but everyone reads like this. Cam Newton, who seems like a nice bloke, and I think that anyone attacking him over, over hearing someone behind him literally saying, like, how shitty he is while after losing the Super Bowl and not doing particularly well, respect the man for that. But his Instagram reads like an insane person. Like, it seems like everything he's done is put through one of those text generators that makes it look weird. It's like, keep your head up and capital letters, except lower letters, the... Capital letters, challenges from life with just numbers thrown in there. Like, this guy is, like, an actual success as well, but also writes like a giant success meme. And I think it is this weird fucking poison, though. It's, like, the kind of an antithetical thing to, like, when House came along. House MD comes along and everyone goes to this thing where it's like, ah, it's time to question everything. You know, like, the fact that Hugh Laurie's British. But anyway, it's a good show. I liked it. But still, there was this time when everyone was like, huh... Maybe being a bit edgy and off is good. Maybe, like, everybody does like it. And then this weird success culture group because I think that a large group of people found this market for just desperate, sad fuckers. And that's where things like Gamergate have come from. That's where people like Mike Cernovich have seen their success. And he's gone totally off the rails in his fucking rules. I love Mike Cernovich. I love when Mike Cernovich, his two things are like mastering breathing and not coming. <laughs> and there was something about like hearing like waves as well. Yeah, he, he say he hears auras. I mean, I think horseshoe theory is mostly bullshit. But when you go so far right wing masculinity, you end up around the other side into sort of like hippie crystal culture. Like, by October, he's going to have talked himself into being a Jill Stein voter. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm surprised he actually took that long. But he's uh, – I saw this video once that Cernovich did where he's like, all right, today we're going to work on the gorilla posture. And by the way, like, who has post- you know, posture as good as a gorilla? <laughs> the animal that spends most of its time on all fours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like a hunched over back. But he, so he's like, this is one of my favorite posture exercises. By the way, like not a thing, but he picks up a trap bar with about 205 pounds on it. Oh God. And just sta- and just stands upright for two minutes straight. He just holds the weight, like just standing. He's just standing upright. And he's like, yeah, this is, this is that real shit. This is like, girls are going to want to fuck you. If you have posture like this And look I'm not saying that girls will like Fuck you if you have Like if you have a bent over like scaredy cat Posture probably not You have some things to work on But I also don't think girls will fuck you Because you have good posture I don't know I'm not a woman I don't know these things But I don't think that's true But Mark Cernovich rules He is a case of somebody who became so into success winning that he became insane. Like he, Mike Cernovich gaslit himself. He successed himself stupid. Yeah, and now he does his Wim Hof breathing method course review. And he's amazing. And all of these success men, for the most part, very quickly, you transition from, and I think this is the methodology behind even the meanest ones and even the nicest ones. They always transition into one thing, money. You are always yeah. going to be dragged 
at some point into having to pay them. But, well, and I know, fuck it, I give PR advice and I've written two books, so sure, at some point. But I don't sit there every day typing, like, the way to pitch is to pitch with your mind, not your body. And, but you look at people like Gary, my, my favorite, Gary Vaynerchuk, who is just, like, the least human person of all time. One of the least least appealing people I've ever seen in my entire life, Gary Vaynerchuk. And just what not even like not even unappealing as in like oh I don't want to take this guy's advice, but like unappealing as in like when you send me videos of him, I'm like I click out of it immediately just out of a reaction nope. and then I have to open it back up and actually watch it. Yeah, the person I want to meet though with Gary Vaynerchuk. So Gary Vaynerchuk, if you're not familiar with him, is he does something with social media. Like I don't know what it is. I once went on a date with a girl who worked for him and I once I realized very quickly I did not like the person. I wasn't mean. I just started asking questions like genuinely what happens there? Like an investigative thing. But there's some weird thing he does where he'll take these really banal quotes and he'll, like, put them on a professional picture of himself and then sign them. Like, stop complaining. Stop making excuses. Nobody is listening. So, wait. So, but what's great with all of them is there's these weird professional photos with them. I want to, like, interview the person who takes them. I want to meet the person. Hey, so what's it like following Gary Vaynerchuk around as he, like, gets into cabs or, like, stands by doors, like, looking like he really desperately needs to take a piss? Yeah, no, that's... Uh- Every picture of Gary Vaynerchuk, every picture of Gary Vaynerchuk that, it of course, has some, like, stupid truism written over it, like, it'll be a picture of Gary Vaynerchuk, and the caption will be, like, uh, the first rule to succeeding is to realize that you need to work. And then he'll be, like, see, he'll be sitting on a large potted plant in an office park. <laughs> okay, <laughs> or like opening opening a door, just like the most. It would be a brilliant. He's a very like Alan Partridge type yeah, guy. He really is. Be, Gary Vaynerchuk would be a brilliant comedic character, but he's real. Felix, I did save one, and this is a present. This is real. This is very real. I, a quote from Gary Vaynerchuk, and it sounds like you wrote it. I am built to get punched in the mouth. I'll spit my front tooth out, look right back at you, and be like, "Now what, bitch?" That's. Uh, I don't think that's a good quality. <laughs> no. That's like that's bad. It's not good for you to lose teeth in a fight. It's not good for you to get head trauma. I don't really think you should brag about that. It's and not, I'm built I don't to get, get punched in the mouth. Like that is actually the true. I'm, it's the truest thing he's ever said. It is true. Like he does. <laughs> I immediately want to hit him when I see him, but. Also, like, notice that uh, it's not like I'm built to fuck people up or whatever. <laughs> I'm built to like, face, get my bitch. ass kicked and, and enjoy it. I'm, I'm built to enjoy just getting abused and owned, like, <laughs> dying. <laughs> I fucking love it. The more I think about it, because I saved this. I, so I, good. I found it, like, a few days ago, and I've been saving this up for you. Because it's just so brilliant, because it's like, now what, bitch? It's like... I'm gonna hit you again. I get like I yeah. Have, no, I'm gonna hit you until you fall down. <laughs> like, and who the fuck hits no, you in like, the mouth? I guarantee you, you're not impossible to knock out because no one is. Certainly not like a 60 year old poker player. That's like the last person I would think. Like, oh wow, I'm gonna have to hit this guy a lot. And what's great is his entire Instagram is this. And this is a dude who he has like a wine club. I don't know why you're meant to believe this guy's an expert. But it's really amazing. It's like, the one question I never wanted to be asked is the Gary Vaynerchuk show. And it's like, I imagine that question, by the way, is from his clients. And it's like, what did you do this month? But there are great ones like, regret drives the shit out of me. (laughs) What? Like, what? What? These aren't motivated. This is just, this is like him complaining. (laughs) I kind of like the idea of regret as some weird, like, laxative. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Whenever he needs to go to the toilet, he's just... Have you noticed that, though? Like, all these guys, like, they don't believe in the concept of regret. Yeah. But they, they also, like, don't believe in the concept. But you can't, like... But their other big thing is, like, learning from mistakes and failure. But how can you learn from mistakes and failure if you don't regret things? Like, if you're in this constant state of... 
I don't regret anything I did. How could you even recognize any move you ever made is wrong? And there are some really good ones, though. And this is across the board, but Gary Vaynerchuk is just an easy target. It's the last one I'll read from him because it's so... He's st- built to be punched in the mouth. I mean, he said it himself. <laughs> Which I think is the... I can't get over this that. This is the greatest quote I've ever heard. But do you, 24-7, 365, always. That is the quote. That's it. And it's a picture of him holding his iPhone, doing a selfie in, like, a beanie. Like, tinted... Like, fucking Steve Zissou-ass motherfucker. <laughs> I mean, I guess he is himself every second of every day. He's unbearable. Yeah. He's absolutely fucking insufferable. He's on brand for just being, like, one of the most fucking stupid... Like, unbelievably... I mean, what I like to believe is that these people, like, have no idea how vapid they are. But it's probably more truthful that they definitely 100% know exactly what they're doing. This is all so calculated, so organized, so powerfully just... Rep- like, I don't even know what the word is, just horrifyingly organized to take people's money. And there's the... I hate this argument as well, where it's like, well, you know what, if they make someone happy, there, there's a goodness to it. It's like, no, these people are hucksters. They're actually, like, terrifying in their existence. Like Guy Kawasaki, the, the guy who, I don't know why he is famous, he was somewhere at some point. And these people, he's not as bad as these people because his version of the success meme is just blog after blog of just empty-headed shit. But I don't fucking know. Like, I feel like this is all so organized and so calculated. that It's terrifying. Seth Godin as well. I'm not sure if you've run into him, Felix, but he's... His whole thing is just basically, he claims to have a blog, but his entire blog is like a sentence long, and it's like, the real marketing power is to get inside someone's mouth. Does he mean, like, to say them, or, like, I, to, I, I like, tongue kiss them? I think he means, truthfully, I think he means that it's meant to be, like, word of mouth. I made that one up, because it's exactly, all of these things, by the way, can universally be re- read wrong. That's also a really good, consistent one with the startup people. That they can all be kind of read with another meaning entirely. Like, uh, alright, I have to do it. Don't worry about your bank account. Worry about how many people will show up at your funeral. Gary Vaynerchuk. Another one that just could be read with a completely different meaning to the intended one. I've noticed that, like, okay, so they're saying, like, do you, be yourself, all day, every day. But how come every picture of it, like, they're always... It's always, like, a posed picture. And I want to know who is taking the picture. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I want to I meet Gary Vaynerchuk's photographer. Like, what's it like to follow this guy around for three fucking days, just watching him getting in, in and out of cabs or look pouty on a fucking stoop? All of them sort of seem like they're running a Ponzi scheme. Yes, absolutely. Bernie Madoff could have avoided prison if he just, like, posted motivational photos. And, like... One one that I give respect to, even though I think he's a pretty terrible artist and I'm sure he's a lovely person, is DJ Khaled. I think DJ Khaled really nailed it because DJ Khaled has pretty much scammed Silicon Valley. And I think it's amazing. Like, I I don't know if you run into him. Of course I have. Uh, DJ Khaled, though, I, like, respect him more than these other guys. Yeah. DJ Khaled, like, I don't really think he's a producer. Like, I don't think he's producing songs. Like, in fact, DJ Khaled's continued involvement uh, with rap artists and the world of hip-hop seems like it was a request made because he was dying. (laughs) It's Make-A-Wish Foundation. Yeah, he's shoehorned in in that way. But I love DJ Khaled. I love all the... Have you noticed in every DJ Khaled music video, the plot of it is that, like, he's going to get T.I., Lil Wayne, Drake, and J. Cole to rap together on the same song, but the FBI is trying to stop them for some reason. And he's always... Like, there's always, like, a, there's always a helicopter chase or a speedboat chase, and they're like, we've got them! We can't allow them to be on the same song together! We it's too crazy! We're not gonna- it's going to tear up the charts! And the song is, of course, playing during this. Or it begins yeah, with him. Yeah, it's like, I don't know why they're doing it. They already made the song. They just want to perform it. It's like the Jason Bourne movies where the CIA just it always goes after Jason Bourne for no reason. They're always going after one guy, and they 
can't do it. Yeah. Like all, all all the guys that they're like chasing DJ Khaled, who's like a fat DJ, yeah. and they can't they can't outwit him. It seems like one of the most easy. <laughs> like he's too good. He's too good. He's too smart. He's the best DJ man Khaled, alive. who has like a twenty word vocabulary, is outwitting <laughs> us. Yeah, it's like, and it's always at some point got him like with some woman, and his like catchphrases are amazingly shit. It's like they're so bad. And another one. Okay, like that's it. We did it. <laughs> and it's like, I, but the way he manipulate, he like used success memes to make millions from fucking idiots in Silicon Valley. But he actually, I believe, I don't think anyone, any way he'd admit this, I believe DJ Khaled did more than just, okay, I'm going to do a Snapchat. I think it was probably a little bit thought about. So, um, where is he? Fr- I, I, he's, um... He's from Miami, because well, of I course mean, what, he is. But, but he's from Miami, but his lineage is some... Oh, he's Palestinian. He's Palestinian. So, checkbox number one of Silicon Valley anxiety is we're all, like, we're all horrible racists. So that's number one. So, wait, someone has come along that's a good one. It's a good, it's a, he's not a scary Middle Eastern, because they, Palestinians, whoa, whoa, but no, he's a good, and wait a minute, he uses Snapchat, and his, fa- his, his, like, crowning moment on Snapchat, the one that got him famous, was he got lost on a fucking, like, jet ski, which I kind of love. He gets lost on a jet ski, he's like, duh, <laughs> lost. And it was like, yay! Yay, he's lost on a jet ski, how adorable. And I think he kind of... Yeah, was- you know what it was? It was like Silicon Valley had custody over a retarded child. <laughs> yes, but I don't think he's that stupid, even though, fuck. Some- I don't either. Some of his quotes definitely would, like, like I, I, I prepared some quotes, some words from him, such as, I remember when I ain't have a jacuzzi. That's it. That's the That's the quote. Oh, okay, okay. That's um, it. Powerful. That's powerful. They don't want you to win. It's great because it's it's great because oh, or he'll just point at someone and go like, "You smart," and it's like he's a fi- like it's like a like, like a sweetie almost like like he's he's like two steps from asking for feet pics from Melissa from Marissa Mayer. And honestly, if he ever does that, I'll donate my net worth to him. I don't fucking care. DJ Khaled is, like, my guy. And then he realized, I think, these, these, this, this kind of massive dipshittery was obsessed for some fucking reason with emojis. So he was like, huh. Sometimes you say something is the key to something. I was fuck it. I use the key emoji. And oh, my God. Holy Christ. The insufferable fucking shit that came out of that. People are like, yeah, that's the key emoji to this. And this dude must, like, sit on being like, ah, look at these fucking idiots. And then he got, he's become, like, a head of media for Snapchat. It's kind of like when Lady Gaga became, like, CMO, like, Polaroid. He just got... How much money, how much money do you think Snapchat pays DJ Khaled a year? Oh, I'm gonna guess at least a million. At least, yeah, easy. What a fucking genius. He, he is. He is a genius. He's like, the he one got success. on Snapchat and, like, got lost and then said shit like, uh... Uh, you know, in order to believe your dreams, you have to go to sleep. And they're like, got it. Okay, we need to give this guy $20,000 a week. Yeah. To keep doing what he was doing. Saying things such as, we the best, they never said it easy to win more. Major key, have good relationships, keep your face clean out there. Like, this This sounds like someone like... It sounds like... like my my like mother-in-law texting like it's it's amazing i th- i think he's ju- i think he's pretty i'd love it if he turned out to be like a harvard graduate or something probably not gonna happen but like it's like it's like he's like just out there just like ah yes this would be easy well i think the most honorable thing you can do in life is like look how much longer is the era of like quick and easy vc money going to exist probably not another two years the greatest thing you can do now is to squeeze as much of it as possible while you can if you are in media in any capacity. Does Snapchat want you to cover the elections for some reason? Does, uh, does fucking Instagram – can you do like a sponsored post on Instagram? Take Say yes to anything because you could die any day and this VC money is not going to last forever and you have to be like DJ Khaled – who at this point has just siphoned millions of dollars. The greatest transfer of wealth between uncool people to a cool person ever. DJ Khaled has taken all these incels' money 
and just spent it on more jet skis and uglier mansions. <laughs> and that's kind of that to me that makes him like a Marxist hero in a way. And it, in a and, way. And and to take this money from these unfuckable children and put it into what I would describe I would not fuck DJ Khaled. I don't think he'd take offense, but he's relatively unfuckable looking. He's definitely had more sex as a result of taking this money. And if there's anything more beautiful than the new corporate America losing shit tons of money to a Palestinian, the this is it. It's beautiful. It, it's ed- have you ever seen the Have you seen the DJ Khaled video where he's he like is fucking or purportedly fucking, and he's like saying to the chick he's like doggy style, he's whispering over over her back. You're a genius. <laughs> That's the he's so good. He's so good. It, I, I think he might actually be way smarter than people like Gary Vaynerchuk. Easily, easily, he's way smarter than Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk. I'm confident in saying this. I'm going to lay this wager on the table. Gary Vaynerchuk hasn't had sex since the 90s. I, yeah, but then he claimed he was Volcel. Yeah, yeah, no, he's going to try to appropriate Volcel culture. Our culture, not your costume. The only way to social better is to fuck never. Gary Vaynerchuk. It, it wouldn't even rhyme, though. It'd yeah. be like, stop complaining and stop fucking. Be, no, no, it would rhyme, but in a really awkward way. So it'd be, stop complaining, stop fucking, be the king. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he right. I bet he loves Hamilton because oh, it rhymes the same way. Oh, God. Uh, Pardon me, are you Gary Vanichuk, sir? Yes, I am, sir. And I, I punch don't the bird, fuck. sir. <laughs> sir? <laughs> I'm Aaron Burr, sir. <laughs> and I'm Hamilton! <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. I, I want to, like... I want to like, like I want to like go to Hamilton with Gary Vaynerchuk, and just see him like cry and like pee himself. He would cry. He would cry during Hamilton. Hamilton would be so beautiful. But I'm gonna write Vaynerchuk, no. which is <laughs> Hamilton, but about Gary Vaynerchuk. Oh god! How does a bastard orphan poker playing son of I a whore? Did Gary Vaynerchuk Scotsman. play? Did he actually play poker? Did he? Is, he purportedly has played poker. What's great is, and I, he used to be one of these success meme people. Jason Calacanis, famous. Another guy, yeah, he's, another, he's big in it. But, too. but he's great because he's not a success guy anymore because a few years ago he kind of was. He'd have his, like, when he was, before all this shit happened that you wouldn't care about, about TechCrunch and the conference or whatever. He was kind of like that insp- uh, inspirational person who... But now he's, like, kind of gone down this weird hole where he's, like, angry at everyone and he has to argue with them. But what's amazing, though, is he'll, like, he's, like, the ultimate success figure in that he doesn't try and do the memes anymore. He just talks about how good he is. And the best thing I ever got shown was by uh, Drew Fairweather, Married to the Sea, and Toothpaste with Dinner. And it's Jason Calacanis did play poker. And he played against Doyle Brunson, who I believe is a pretty fucking big deal in the poker circuit. He's like a cowboy-hatted dude who just sat, sat there and in this beautiful video, which we'll link, in, we'll link into to this, just sits there and is just like, well, looks like the Silicon Valley boys there. And Jason Calcanis is like trying to be, he's got, he's clearly got this look on that he has at all times of like this re- reasonless confidence. And then he just, you see the percentage go down and down and he's like breaking confidence and he's like so close to tears at the end. But the best thing is if you look up Jason Calcanis poker, there is a core thing of the first result is, is Jason Calcanis actually good at poker? Does he really play high stakes a lot? Two answers. One answer I played with Jason, he's quite looped in, blah, 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 blah. And the next one is this huge answer from him, basically doing the version of, I'm not mad, this is funny to me, which is he uses emojis. And he is the king of that. He's the least mad man online. Uh, he, he is, he is so, he like argues with everyone from like other people in his industry to just random Gamergate people and also SJW people. He like he's he, but he's also really stupid. Like if you if you catch him during like an argument that he has with like any group of people cuz he's argued with I'm pretty sure I've seen him argue with like ISIS accounts. <laughs> but uh if you're just like, "Yeah, Jason, fuck them up." 
he won't even like look if you're being sarcastic and he'll follow you. And retweet because it. Because he's like the dumbest man alive. He follow he literally what does he follow? Like twenty thousand people now? <laughs> he's he's unfollowed me and followed me again. Which is amazing because I I think I've like called him like You've only a abused him. Yeah, I've been not I've never been I think maybe in my first days of PR I was like, oh, a person of fame. Then I had like an unpleasant encounter with him when I met him at a party and he was just a dick. But it doesn't really matter. And it's great as well because these the, these people in general are just these fucking they it, they just there's this insane like cloud around them. It, startups or not, big like bad boy think they're tough guy people like Cernovich. They think they have this aura around them that says whatever you're saying is intelligent. Keep going. Someone likes it. And it's a, like, I don't know when does their nervous breakdown happen. Really, that's my question. Um, I don't know. Okay, so we're kind of coming full cir- circle here because what is like the common theme I've noticed with all these guys? I think you might have noticed it too. They all play poker. Huh? They're apart, like really into poker. Apart from DJ Khaled. Yeah. DJ Khaled, well, because DJ Khaled isn't actually one of these guys. Like, he's smarter than all of them. He's, like, way more successful and happier. He's way... He, I take it back. He's the only not fraud out of all of them. Yeah, he's, like, the real guy. Like, he, DJ Khaled is way more successful, way happier than all of these people. And he doesn't play poker. But, like, okay, why do you think they like to play poker? Because it's a game classically associated with people who think that they can manipulate the odds when they actually can't. It's that, and, like, half the game is just, like, pretending, like, everything is going great while you're falling apart inside. (laughs) It's it's true. (laughs) It's horribly, depressingly true. And on top of that, it's, it's a game, it's one of the only games in the house where you're actively trying to beat someone. So it's like a dick measuring contest mixed with hiding your emotional breakdown. That's, yeah, poker is the dumbest game. It's really stupid. You just, like, a 17-hour emotional collapse that you have with other, like, disgusting men at a table. It's way cooler to bet on sports. Uh, you know, actually, actually, my favorite James Bond movie is Casino Royale, and I'll oh, tell you why. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm right there with because you. Because, yeah, half the movie, right, is, like, it's a poker drama, and James Bond keeps losing, but he finally wins. But it doesn't matter because Lee Sheaf is like, no, I'm not just going to let you take all my money in a poker game. I'm going to fucking kidnap you, you moron. And hit you, <laughs> and hit you in the balls with a rope. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, that was great. I thought that was like a great – Casino Royale was the most subversive and most brilliant James Bond movie be- movies because it showed that James Bond is like an alcoholic loser – it showed that like, he's a psycho. It showed that he can't get along with people. And it showed like the classic James Bond thing of like you have to win a poker game to take all the villains' money. That that doesn't work. Like they like why would a mass murdering terrorist be like, oh you won fair and square. Shit. That's why that's such a brilliant movie. That's such a good movie. It's also- <laughs> and that's an under that's an underrated, very good satirical hook of the movie that I feel like no one really got that I thought was re- really funny. I'm right there with you, and I think that it's true though, poker I've seen multiple people, like people I've worked with, people I've People I, I've spent, I've worked with people I just don't like seeing do it as well, and there these they stumble into these poker games like watch this, and five minutes later they're like yeah I lost all my money, <laughs> I'm in debt now. So these fucking like and I'll look back at the table and it's all these old like wrinkled gas bag men just sitting there. It's fucking like they haven't moved for six days, but they're like a millionaire now. Because that's all they do. All they do is wait for, like, the dumb 20-somethings to walk in and just get hosed. Yeah, they're just owning people out of money right and left. When I went to Atlantic City, the most, like, depressing area outside of the slot area is the poker area. Because it's just all old people who have no moisture left in their body. Well, who was this? Nickel and diming. Well, who was they? On, an, on the note of more success, man... And you'll notice that it really is dudes. You rarely see women pulling this there shit. There are a lot of women who do this. Yeah, it's probably because... Really aren't. Well, you know, band men, obviously. Um, 
Uh, but there's this other one that I forget the name of who had all the horrible ebooks. He was like, from broke to having a Lambo. Oh, wait, Ty Lopez. Ah, oh, Ty Lopez. That's him. Ty Lopez is the worst. He's the worst one of these guys. I fucking hate him. But he's, he's, <laughs> he's the worst. But all of them also have another thing where they try and, like, Jason Calacanis I would take out of this because he doesn't sell things to people quite so much. He's not like a Ty Lopez or, to a lesser extent, Tim Ferriss type. But he's like... They all do this thing where they worm into the heads clearly of people who are, if not suffering, they're kind of spinning their wheels. They're not really doing much with their lives. They're fucking, like, depressed. And this Ty Lopez guy is amazing because he is, like... He's basically... He may as well just write Todd to success because that's what he means. It's like... 67 steps that took me from broke to driving Lambo slash Ferrari. Like, I, also, deep down, I'm like, please tell me you're a crazy rich person that can bind those cars. But I, I just... And he's always... They're always at fucking, like, UFC fights, like Ty Lopez. Or there's this other one who is too, much, much lamer. Actually, possibly... He's a lovely fella and all, but he's fucking sad. John Shahidi who you wouldn't know because he's done literally nothing other than release a selfie app called Shots that has money from Justin Bieber and every photo is him in Vegas with Justin Bieber or some, like, like gunt, gunt fortitude from Snapchat. Like, he's always with a fucking random new Snapchat guy with a million followers somehow. But they all have this thing where they worm into the heads of people who don't think they're quite where they should be. And they're like, huh, well, I'm not quite broke. Because no one actually broke is reading Ty Lopez. No one actually broke is doing that. It's always fucking, like, people are making eh, 40 to 50 grand, I'd say, who pick up these ebooks and they're like, oh, finally. And it's like, Jesus Christ, it's scary. I mean, and I think just... I am not outright accusing him of this, but it just seems to be the case from reading what I've read. It seems like Ty Lopez is running some type of scam. Doesn't Isn't that kind of what it seems like? Well, I judge by the fact that his, I think it's his pin tweet that I saved, where it says, how to make one million. Sell a $200 product to 5,000 people. Sell a $500 product, dollar product to 2,000 people. All the way up to sell a $4,000 product to 250 people. Oh, right. Of course. It's that easy, right? And the, by the way, the, the thing below it is find whatever works and crush it. Actually, I take it back. I saved this page. It was posted 59 minutes ago. That's how fucking... It, it's a Saturday. I had a Bloody Mary. I woke up at 9 in the morning. This, do this dude has just been on it today. Like, it's a fucking Saturday, dude. You worthless tit. And hashtag laser focused. Fuck you. I don't even know what this guy does. I don't know who he is. What's he do? He just... Okay, so I, like, read up on him once, and he's like, uh, when I graduated college, I wrote a bunch of letters to entrepreneurs asking them to be my mentor. And then I... Okay, you know, like, the joke I always make where I'm, like, another great day in the business industry. Yeah. I love being in the business industry. And it, like, goes back to when I lived in Minnesota, and we knew this kid who was kind of stupid and always listened to Stained and wore No Fear t-shirts. And he asked my friend Kyle once, famously, he goes, Kyle, doesn't your dad work in the business industry? <laughs> <laughs> it just always <laughs> stuck with me. So it's always... I've said it for, like, now probably five years. I never knew when I heard that Five years ago. Because I'll never stop saying it because it's so funny. But that is... Like, Ty Lopez would tell you he's in the business industry. Because you, ne you never know what he's selling or, like, wow, how he's making his money. But he's just like, uh, when I dared myself to be successful. He's the most non-specific of all non-specific businessmen. He makes Dan Blitzarian looks like look like he's giving you a PowerPoint of his earnings and yeah, like his tax returns. Income. Well, he's yeah. a, he's also one of the most evil people ever because if you type in Ty Lopez Wikipedia, he's actually he's not stupid because he created SEO content so that you only find this Ty Lopez Wikipedia WordPress .com, which is written by him. It isn't clear that it's him, but the subtle clue is it links to one of his fucking things. And the next result, of course, is is Ty Lopez a scam? I've been on Ty Lopez's 67 Steps that is undoubtedly 
some good advice, okay. But after I tried to cancel the recurring billings for his VIP calls that you have to do in order to stop paying the $67 every month, I started doubting because I was unable to cancel my subscription. Fucking hell. Like he said on Chapo once, like, to, like the end of the world is now. Things are not good. Yeah, it's not good that, like, Ty Lopez is just allowed to continue unimpeded. Like, seriously, this guy is... A, he needs to be detained. Like, I, that's the thing. Like, there is no... There is no, like, actual fucking... There is no actual fucking, like, thing to what he does. Like, I don't know... What it is this man does exactly? Like I like no, he probably doesn't know what he does. I bet his sixty-seven steps are like the Steve Martin joke, where it's like how to become a millionaire. First of all, get a million dollars, and and his his LinkedIn is brilliant as well because it's investor focused on online education systems that help people solve the four hard problems of life through mass marketing: how to create health, wealth, love, higher purpose. By the way, I love the idea that he's written mass marketing there because that's kind of him admitting that it's all a fucking scam. Yeah, no, that it clearly is. I love him, but I think that we've like covered our favorite success guys. So I I have my own theory about like why this is so popular, but I want to ask you first. Like, why do you think? Why do you think that this is such a big thing? Why do you think, like, these guys all use the same language culture, all sort of portray the same image, all have the sort of same ideas? Why do you think this is now, like, a defined internet subculture? Well, step one is it became easier to pay people online and connect to bank accounts. I think that that's a big thing. And social media. But on top of it, I think it's this thing where when you're down... And you're feeling like shit. You ju- on some level, you do want to just get like sadder. So that's where, or you want to like fight back. That's where people like Blitzerian. That's frankly where people like uh, Rich Piana, but to a less like not really an evil extent. But that's where a lot of this culture of like oh, get tough, fight back comes back from. Where the positivity comes through is, I think they've connected into a really nasty part of both online and offline, which is people who are like smile. People who say, cheer up, chin up. So, of course, you're being told this in your ear, and it's actually fucking worthless advice. But then you have this person who comes along and say, oh, I'm broke. But you know what? I'm not broke anymore. I'm in a Lambo and a Ferrari somehow. And suddenly you are this, if you're in this position where you don't have friends who say, hey, dude, no. You are an, you're an easy target. It's just another con. It's like every one of those get rich quick schemes. It's a pyramid scheme without the fucking pyramid. It's incredible because it, pyramid schemes grew in my experience in my reading from finding people who couldn't find a job or who couldn't find a job they loved. And then they got told, oh, you can work from home or whatever, or you can just join us and we'll support you. And then, of course, they never do. But then someone realized, wait a minute, I don't even need to fucking make much effort. I can just show people where I have found a way to jump. And I'm sure there's a hole within every one of these stories, by the way, where they found a way to get successful through some sort of leapfrogging or a bunch of money they were given. But all of them exude this thing where no matter where you are, you could be a multimillionaire one day. You could be there. You could be even more success. I guarantee all of them at some point say you could be even more successful than me. Same. It's, it's a psychological thing. It's actually beautifully manipulative. It's the same reason that you get a lot of, and this isn't actually an attack. I fuck it. I fucking watch Naruto and it's brilliant, but it's the same reason you get a lot of sad nerds who watch a shit ton of anime. They all have the same message. Work hard and you'll be happy. You'll get the girl you want. There's a nasty psychosis to this all. Don't know if you agree with me, but that's just my take. And I think I do kind of agree with you in my reason. Uh, my What I think this all is is, okay, we've, like, talked about this, you know, my my reading on it. We've talked about this theme before in the show. But I think it's, like, it's the Protestant work ethic. It's Calvinism. And this the reason that these people are so into, like, 
failure just means success because, of course, you're predestined to succeed. In fact, all failure is just, you know, it's a test that God threw in front of you because you know you're going to succeed. You're the right type of person. It's the Irenaean uh, theodicy. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. And I think that, like, the, the parts about self-denial and concealing your emotion, they're just – it's a different type of – that's social conservatism. It's social conservatism in a new light, under this new light where they finally removed God, the pesky God part from this belief system, where you are literally just worshiping entrepreneurship. This is less a guide to life or a means of conducting business than it is a quasi-religious belief system because you're getting to the part where you're managing all your emotions even outside of work hours and – what were we talking about? There is no distinction between work hours and leisure hours anymore. That's what these people always tell us is the great thing about the tech revolution, that you can be working all the time. So you are who you are in your office all the time. And what they always wished was true, that you, the, per, the your character shines through by how you conduct yourself in business. It is true because the you that conducts yourself in business is no longer differentiated from the you who is clocked out. Because that's not a term that exists anymore. Yeah. It is the ultimate late capitalism victory of the Protestant work ethic. It is the Protestant work ethic without God. It is the sheer worship of American entrepreneurial spirit and the destruction. You see little seeds of destruction that are meant to – of anything that's meant to protect workers along the way. Like – don't take credit for work. Yeah, God forbid that you know you get any semblance of credit or promotion or being paid what you're worth by your boss or you have any equity in your own intellectual property. No. Just these little seeds along the way. So I think it's – we make fun of it, but it's part of something very sinister, I think. And it does go back to this – well, the very, the very strong evil parts of faith where – it's this idea, you talk about removing emotion. Well, the, where do they remove that emotion? Personal fucking branding. All these people sound the same, and they get disciples who sound the same. They say the same kind of shit. And those people, so maybe it is a form, it's a, like a psychological pyramid scheme, where you're like building on these people's insecurities and their failures. You're saying, when you failed, you were just on your way to finding me. And what I have found... And that's the scariest thing. And the scary thing is, these people, they're only going to... Like, you know what? I don't know. This isn't a religious podcast anymore. But it's, like, they're not going to get punished in this fucking life. They're going to ride into the highway. And the truth is that if you think, oh, what if they haven't paid their taxes? Oh, like, the fucking IRS is going to come after them. They'll probably just pay over time. They're, never, they're, they're not stupid enough to be like a, a celebrity who doesn't pay their taxes for 10 years. They'll dodge. They'll duck. They'll no, jab, jab, dodge or whatever fuck Vaynerchuk's book is called. And that's the thing. It's It's got a real evilness to it. This, like, yeah, they're about getting uh, getting away with as much as they possibly can get away with. Getting as close to running a full-on Ponzi scheme without actually fully l- running one under the legal definition and such. But they are technically frauds. They're not technically frauds. They are frauds. But they have, They're defrauding everybody. But they found a way by making people... By making people, like say the things they say and retweet the things they they tweet they're ultimately they're ultimately like finding a way to say they're not frauds because they're like well these people got a lot out of it and it's like they're cult leaders uh, it's it's the people love to fucking like and it's they should the whole trump university thing not to be too trite but you know what this is just as bad ty lopez is just as fucking bad except he's worse because like, I I don't know. No, he's probably not worse than Trump. But, I mean, it's like the shit Olympics. I think, he, I think he'd still get, like, a brown medal or whatever. But it's just scary. It's scary that these people exist. And they will eventually... Because, what, because it's also a symptom of the people they're cr- crying out to having enough disposable income and enough credit income... Or enough credit cards to put up their anuses that they can get $67 a month from however many thousands of people by putting out vapid, empty shit and I would put money on these motherfuckers 
actually having someone else do it. No, that's how all of it works. There was look up shreds. It was a fitness company that did the same thing. But this is this operates like a Ponzi scheme because okay, what does Ty Lopez do? Ty Lopez probably starts off by renting a Lamborghini and being like, Oh, I drive this Lamborghini, see how I did it. And then enough people subscribe to his thing where he can actually buy a Lamborghini or buy a different car. And well, yeah, you did. You know, he finally buys the car outright. But he sold these made up. He what he sold these people to begin with by using the Lamborghini as a way to sell this lifestyle that he supposedly has is his system of success. And it doesn't actually mean anything. The only thing he could tell you how what to do is to tell you how to fool people, how to create an image. And that is that's ex- he's running a Ponzi scheme. That is a fucking Ponzi scheme. And that's the and the amazing thing as well. And I think a great way to break this down as well is it's actually not that hard to have the things. And again, it's all psychological to have the things that make you look rich. So you could buy like I don't know, there are one hundred twenty thousand dollar Lamborghinis. Now, by no means a small amount of money. But all you need to do is scam enough fuckers to get one hundred twenty grand. So I don't know. You get whatever number of people to pay sixty-seven dollars a month. I don't do math, and I won't do math because that involves research. But that's not a shit. Maybe he financed it. No one's gonna go through Ty Lopez's fucking bank accounts. He probably did. I financed my fucking Tesla. I don't care. It's like it's not that hard to actually put that together. Shit. If he wanted to. Let me just, well, 50 Cent's bankruptcy was a great example of this. He claims he rented everything, and I was like, that's bullshit. Go on Airbnb right now and look for, say, a $2,000 a night uh, Malibu place. It will look like a multi-million dollar, it's probably like a $50 million place. Place in Napa, $1,700 a night. That's an $11 million house with, like, fucking, like, 12 bedrooms and shit. You could just go there, take a few photos, shit, rent it for two nights. You don't actually have it. You don't need to have it. You could stay in a fucking bed set. You could be living in, like, the worst parts of Richmond, California. No one would know, but they'll keep paying. And that's evil. Gary Vaynerchuk's even more efficient. He uh, he just sort of, like, stands around looking mopey. Like, he could actually have zero dollars except to pay a photographer and somehow keep creating the worst YouTubes ever. And it's, it's, it's all this kind of false stuff that goes back to the very earliest parts of the, of just the worst shit that people used to do when it was okay back in the day when they used to just kill people to become king. It's like you can fake it. It, it really is fake it till you make it, but they'd never say that ever. I'd respect them if they did, but I'd respect them more. Yeah, it's at least they're going out and doing something. <sighs> Nothing is actually being done here. They're the fucking worst. But do you have a shit of the week this week? I do. I have a small shit of the week. Uh, So uh, this week, um, so Donald Trump, uh, as part of his campaign, uh, has a position called election monitor. Right. This should not cause any alarm because every campaign in American history has had these. Yeah. Someone to watch the polls to look out for fraud or at least raise big shit about it if it's a close county. Right. Obama had them. Romney had them. I'm sure everyone McCain has them. had them. Clinton had them. Gore had them. Kerry had them. Right. It's an established thing. But uh, because uh, the media – Trump is going to lose barring some outstanding October surprise, which, hey, it's always possible. Uh, he's going to lose and – Members of the media really want to make themselves believe that they did it, not like Trump's own failure and the demographics of voters widely rejecting him. So they made a big thing about this and said that Trump was hiring goons to intimidate poll workers, which, you know, if that sounds familiar, it was a talking point of far right wing people against Obama, who said that he was hiring Black Panthers to intimidate white voters in Pennsylvania. Both cases, not actually true because you are describing something that has always existed in campaigns. This wouldn't bother me if it was not people who are not only paid to cover politics, but are in charge of news bureaus about politics. Oh, Christ. Just incredible fucking incompetence. Holy shit. 
You should be fucking ashamed of yourselves. You should never even think about politics again. You should not be allowed to vote. Fuck off. Shut the fuck up. And these people as well. If you talk about... I saw this fucking comment the other day that really, really got on my ass. I think if it went up there, literally, it'd be less paid for. It was something like, you know what? I'm so... I just watched Fox News, and it's amazing what people in this country... What some people in this country think. And someone responded with what they're told to think. And it's that kind of fucking attitude that just... That's the problem. Like, those people are actually wor- worse than Fox News to me. Yeah, like, liberals are all, aren't also full of shit. And liberals do have their own bullshit media outlets that just tell them what they agree with. Yeah, no, that's... I mean, because that's what media is. I mean, we've talked about it. It's uh, finding the maximum amount of number that people that agree with you. That liberals think they're any better... Is amazing, and it's 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 yeah. That it, it just, this election's the shit of the week. What a blow in the cartridge. Fuck. I really can't wait till it's over. I can't fucking wait till it's over, so people can go back to realizing that reporters are mostly useless, and go back to abusing them. Yeah, I. I That's what I'm most excited for. I am so sick of people respecting these people. Do you think a bunch of political reporters are just gonna get fired once it's done? Just done. Oh, God, I hope so. Holy shit, I hope so. I don't want to... I, I hope that they get other jobs because yeah. I don't want anyone... I don't Even people I think are shit, I don't want them to be jobless. I don't want anyone to have a hard time in that way, but I don't know. I hope they fucking work for Ty Lopez or something. Something more honorable than what they're doing now. I, I love that, but there's nothing less honorable than my shit of the week. Which is, of course, the Washington Post's, and I didn't have one until today, and it came along to save me. I don't need air conditioning, and neither do you, from the Washington Post's Girk Flutley. No, Karen Heller. And it starts off with one... Cressica Gunch. (laughs) Cressica Gunch, yes, of course. This first line is amazing, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this first line really needs talking about. It's time to come out of the closet... Or more precisely, the sweat lodge. So, starting off great. It starts off great because it's like, okay, so you've appropriated a phrase that has an incredible amount of weight to homosexual people who are admitting to the rest of the world that they are gay. So you've just taken it to refer to fucking air conditioners and you not liking them. Thank you. Thank you for appropriating the fucking language of a very serious, important thing for your vapid, empty shit house of an article. So this article, and I'll cherry pick some quotes as I want to do, but basically this entire article, the argument is that air conditioning is, is something you shouldn't have because they live in a 1920s house. This woman lives in a 1920s house in Philadelphia, a fucking, and I, and I quote, it has epic humidity, the air is putrid, stagnant, and if it were a color, it would definitely be mustard. So, this woman goes through this big rant, this big fucking thing. And you know what? It's not about being a woman. It could be a man, or a dog would probably do a way better job with this. And she goes along and rants about this thing. One third of American houses don't have air conditioning. All this bullshit. And I love, and since I've started annotating stuff, I've noticed that like 90% of these opinion things is actually just quoted stuff. It's incredible. Like you said, opinion writing is the easiest job in the world. It's very easy. Uh, and I think that's just kind of a symptom of the people who are like, all right, we need to fill this space today. I don't think you always have to fill the space. In fact, if you remember uh, regular, like, actual physical newspapers, they had little things like the crossword puzzle or uh, comics. And I think that they need to have more. I think they, in the place of many opinion columns... There should actually you should be like allowed to play Tetris or something. That would actually be brilliant. That I I'd love that. It's pretty smart, right? But it, it's way better than this fucking article. And it, she says, "Yes, to humble brag, which I may be doing right now, about our greater tolerance, lower carbon footprint, and puny electric bills, which are half the temperature outside." Well done. Well fucking done. And this article, by the way, with all of these opinion pieces, the reason that I think they actually fill that space is not just to fill the space because their actual point is about three sentences long. 
And don't worry, she doesn't have a point. But it's also because it's like, well, I proved it. I, I, I remember in school they said I needed three sources. But this this woman's opinion is amazing because it's like, I don't like the hermetic feel of central air, the way it reduces everything to an artificial harm, makes you feel isolated from your environment, your body's natural responses, and depending on your age, all the summers of your youth. So you... Like, I don't even fucking know what that's meant to mean, but there's a great bit where, and this is the last bit I'll quote because my head will explode. Air conditioning is not sultry or mysterious. It has no place in pulp fiction or film noir. The movie Body Heat is set in a small Florida town in 1981 and is completely devoid of central air, which manages to make absolutely everything seem sexy. Ice cubes, sweat, even wind chimes, which are generally just annoying. This person believes that, like, air conditioning has this effect on cinema. And it's fucking brilliant. I can't, I can't even count on all my hands and, fi- and toes, all, on all my fingers and toes, how many great air conditioner-themed movies that I love. And that's not even including the movies where the subtext is about air conditioning. The Terminator is about air conditioning. Yeah. The Terminator represents a... Uh, a Whirlpool HC-130 room cooler unit, whereas T-1000 represents a sharper sharper image vertical-oriented uh, air conditioner. It's a very deep movie. All movies, you know, like, uh, like Freud said, everything, even things that aren't about air conditioning are about air conditioning. We need to get that air conditioning out of all of our movies. And this woman is... I'm com- finished. This woman's completely right as well, because, frankly... I've watched several pornography movies in the last week, and I've had to turn them off because it's air conditioning. Yeah, I mean, do you notice that every porn that's come out in the past 10 years has been about air conditioning? Like, they're all... The most popular porn series is called Oh No, (laughs) The Air Conditioner Maintenance Guy is Inside My Wife. (laughs) And there are 20 of those movies now. The HVAC Guy is fucking my daughter. (laughs) And that's the thing. It's another popular series. Well, it's both the ones where I can hear the air conditioner, that kind of... Uh, hermetic hum in the background. I hear it, and I it's just the only way it can come. Well, it's actually it makes... if I hear. <laughs> yeah, I need I need a real fan, but also HVAC systems are really what lead to and plumbing as well. If you really look into it, are what lead to most uh, marital marital uh, infidelity. If you think about it, it's always yeah. they break, and then someone comes along and fucks your wife. And people are going to say, "Oh, what about pizza delivery guys?" Uh, okay, Mr. Smart Guy, two things. A, what does the pizza delivery guy have on inside of his car? Air conditioning. Yep. Two, on a hot day, the pizza delivery guy is like, Hi, oh, ma'am, I have a pie with extra pepperoni. And the wife is, like, in her house, in her open bathrobe. Why is she not wearing anything under her bathrobe? Because it's hot. Uh, because of air conditioning. And she goes, why don't you come inside? Why is she offering him to come inside? Because there's air conditioning inside. And he's hot. We need to get all this air conditioning out of these movies. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. Our children are watching. Get it out of here. Get the air conditioning out of all those Ty Lopez videos that I watch all the time. And Gary Vaynerchuk, if you look at his many pictures, is never in air conditioning, which I think really proves... Never, never, which is why he's honest. And I think a great place to end the show is with a Gary Vaynerchuk quote. It's uh, from three weeks ago. It is, the, the caption is, do shit. And it is taken with him with his, in a bomber jacket with his arms folded, standing in what looks like rainy terminal something in Heathrow Airport in London. And the thing it says on it is, practitioner to the bone. Badass. <laughs> and that's true. You do need to do shit. You need to... You need to be alive. And I, I just wonder if he means, like, just boning down. I don't know what he means. I don't even know why he was in London. There's no pot. There's really no reason for Gary Vanacek to leave the block that he lives on. Yeah, this this image is probably taken from, like, a while ago. And he's probably the reason the Brexit happened. He is, yeah. No, he's absolutely the reason the Brexit happened. He's also indirectly responsible for a rash of airport bombings around the world. And and that's and that's the thing. And I just really, I just really love this episode because we've 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 come to the larger realization that Gary Vaynerchuk not only is built to be punched, but actually wants you to. I think. So that's and a, that's good because he, you that's a normal person's reaction to seeing him. Yeah, it's, that ought to just call the fucking police. 
I would immediately call the police, and I've never called the police in my life. And the police wouldn't even know, like, what he does. They'd be like, oh my god, Gary Vaynerchuk, SWAT team. You go, we, have a, we have a code for Ver- Gary Vaynerchuk being in the area. We're getting a, We're getting two choppers inbound. No, no. We're calling the National Guard. No, Bob was just like, I'm very sorry for the losses we're going to have today, but we have had to send in a uh, Predator drone. Take out the area. <laughs> Obama would send in an A-10 warthog and spray the entire area. It would be like it would be like if there was a dirty bomb filled with like Ziploc. Like there was someone just like put Zika pus onto a batch of TNT and just sprayed Zika everywhere. Obama would be like, I don't know what else we can do. We just have to like napalm the entire 10 foot square mile area. Yeah. To kill all the disease. We have to annihilate all traces of Gary Vanichuk. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to end this this has been the scumbag and this you now know how to succeed and i thank myself of course i'm ed zitron i'm felix speederman you guys are never gonna fail you ne- failure is winning and success and that is the key emoticon thank you big time key goodbye everybody <laughs>